Hello and welcome to Noel's Retro Lab. This is the Invest Spectrum Plus that had that horrible green tint that we fixed a few weeks ago. So today we're finally going to put it through its paces and figure out what exactly makes it different from a Sinclair ZX Spectrum Plus. Now it's time to fix the keyboard membrane, which if you remember just totally fell to pieces when we pulled it out of the board. And I'd say it's not worth trying to attempt any repairs. It feels brittle. It feels like dry leaves in the fall. So I'm sure it's full of cracks everywhere. So we should just replace it. Fortunately, the keyboard is exactly the same as the Sinclair ZX Spectrum. So we can just use a fresh brand new membrane. It's actually surprisingly clean inside, so all we have to do is put this back and put the new membrane. So one thing that is important when dealing with these kind of membranes is that you can't just go ahead and test it now you actually need to put these brackets back in place so they push here with a fair amount of pressure. Otherwise, you won't get a good contact and the keyboard simply just will not work. Let's see if the keyboard works now. Yeah, perfect. All the keys work great. Now let's put a diagnostics cartridge and see if we find any problems with this machine. So it didn't recognize the ROM, but I'm not surprised. It's a different ROM than the regular ZX Spectrum one. Other than that, everything passes. So sweet, looks like it's ready to go. So now for the final test, let's try playing Saber Wolf with one of my favorite joysticks. Yeah, that's looking great. In this game, you just have to play with a joystick. It's impossible with a keyboard. So I just kept playing and playing. I must have restarted a couple times, but I found my first piece of the medallion. And then not too far, I found the second piece of the medallion. And, oh wait, what's going on with the screen? Oh no, what is happening? The colors are just glitching out and it just keeps getting worse. This is five minutes later and this is unplayable. Wow, I thought we were done with the color problems in this computer. I've been trying to get the same thing to happen for over half an hour and just it's just not happening. I'm not getting that weird glitch at all. So I'm thinking it may be related to something heating up because those are the kind of problems that happen after you've been running something for 10, 15, 20 minutes. And because right now I took the board out of the case, it's, you know, this is getting pretty hot, but it's not heating everything else up. So that's probably why I'm not seeing anything. I suspect that if you put this back in the case and waited 30 minutes running something, we might start seeing that video glitch. So to test that theory, instead of putting everything back in the case, what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to heat up the board a little bit on purpose with a uh, heat gun. Specifically, I'm going to guess that the problem comes around the PAL encoder chip, some of those resistors and some of those capacitors that we saw all last episode. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to guess that something is going on in there. So I'm going to heat up just that area and see if we notice anything. Notice I'm not going to get too hot. I'm hitting this up to 130 degrees Celsius. There you go. I won't get too close. I'm going to start heating up in there. And 
we go. There we go. It immediately started getting all glitchy. And now just to test this, I have a cold spray. I'm going to spray it and see if that goes away. Boom. Look at that. So it's definitely related to something heating up over there that causes the pallet coating chip not to work correctly. So, you know, because I limited everything to that area, we know it's, we know it's not in the ULA or somewhere else. The question is, what is it exactly? Is it, is it the chip itself? Is it one of those, one of those RC circuits? It's hard to say. I'm going to see if it can heat up just that area. Yeah. And if I hit just the chip, hmm. So maybe it is the chip. Maybe this particular chip just gets warm and um, starts failing inside. That's an easy test. We can bring back the chip from the QL. Now I'm going to heat up the chip directly. I mean, it's hard because it's really hard to aim the heat at a particular place. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That happened really quickly. And we, every time we get different results too. Boom. Yeah, it's looking like it might be the chip. Okay, so here we have the new PAL encoder chip from the QL. And everything is running fine again. So let's apply some heat to speed things up to the chip directly. And so far, so good. It's definitely getting a little hot. And I'm not seeing any glitching whatsoever. Yeah. I don't want to get it too hot and then damage something, but I think we should have been seeing something already. Yeah, this is pretty hot already. So yeah, I'm going to stop right there. I think the Palin coating chip had a problem and when it got hot, it started you know, glitching out slightly, probably just generating that color burst slightly out of sync, which is probably the most delicate part of the chip and the whole circuit. And that was just enough to throw the colors away. So this one seems rock solid. Now that it's finally working correctly, we can run some tests on it. The Invest Spectrum Plus had a reputation for not being very compatible with the Sinclair ZX Spectrum. Was this really true? Let's look at the real differences and run some tests to see them in action. Before I start with other more important differences, I wanted to touch on the image quality. Last time I mentioned that the Invest Spectrum had the MC1377P PAL encoder chip as opposed to the LM1889 on the Sinclair ZX Spectrum. I had read that the Invest PAL chip was supposed to be a much better quality encoder, a professional grade one specifically, and I wondered what exactly that meant. Then I started taking captures comparing the two models and the difference became immediately obvious. Both these videos are captured with a composite mod, although the Sinclair ZX Spectrum has a mod without a transistor so the output isn't as bright, but even if you ignore the brightness, the quality difference is amazing. The Sinclair one flickers all the time, whereas the Invest has a much more solid image. This is probably also the fact that the Invest has a single, unified master clock signal, which means it will always be in sync with the color clock and avoids that crawling effect. I hadn't noticed the image quality difference as much before because the quality of the image on my Sony CRT TV is actually really good, even for the Sinclair ZX Spectrum one. I suspect it has some internal circuitry to improve the image significantly, but when you output it to a capture card like this or to an LCD, the difference is huge. So 
This is a big plus for the Invest. The sync layer is that a Spectrum CPU runs at exactly 3.5 MHz. If you remember from last time, the Inves CPU runs at 3.5469 MHz, so that's only 1.34% faster. Even though the Spectrum programs weren't prepared to run at different clock speeds, it should virtually make no difference, right? Let's run an experiment. I'm going to run a very famous game that probably everybody here knows, which is Manic Miner, one of my favorites. This is captured directly from the hardware, and on the left we have the Inves 1, and on the right is the Sinclair ZX Spectrum 1. And oh my, what's going on? That's right, the Inves Spectrum ran 18.7% faster, that's almost 20%. What's going on in here? The answer is lack of memory contention. A general problem that computers need to solve is access to memory from multiple sources. Normally, there's a part of the RAM that is mapped to video, and that needs to be accessed and read about 50 to 60 times per second to generate the video signal. It needs to be accessed at a very specific speed to match the video data being output with the trace of the CRT TV. In the case of the ZX Spectrum, that's the ULA's job. That's why when you turn on a ZX Spectrum with a bad or even missing Z80, you still see a screen with a black and white bars or some other colorful garbage. That's the uninitialized memory that the ULA is reading by itself. What happens when the CPU is executing a program and wants to read from memory while that's going on? You would think that we could let the two reads happen simultaneously, after all, we're just reading, not modifying the memory. What's the harm? The problem is that RAM can only do one operation at a time, and the data requested by the ULA is needed urgently to keep up with the raster beam, so that's top priority. Different computers solve this problem in different ways. It's actually one of the defining characteristics of different architectures, and whatever solution is used will often affect how the rest of the system is built and how games can be programmed in the most efficient way. In the case of the sync layers that I Spectrum, they solve this by stalling the CPU while the ULA is reading the video data. And how do they stall it? Very simple. The ULA generates the CPU clock signal, so it controls its activity. Whenever the ULA is reading from video memory and it detects that the Z80 is about to make another read from video memory, it simply stops the clock signal going to the CPU. It seems really low tech, but it's effective at the cost of stalling the CPU every so often. And why am I going into all of this? Because the Invest Spectrum doesn't do it that way. It seems that the ULA will sneak in memory requests while the Z80 is doing other things, probably using half clock cycles, although that I'm not totally sure about, so there's no slowing down of the Z80 at all. That's why we're seeing such huge speed up in some games. Let's actually confirm that with the oscilloscope. Okay, so I have a regular Sinclair ZX Spectrum board, this is my own, and we're going to look at the clock signal going into the CPU that is generated by the ULA. So I'm going to turn this on, and what we're seeing is just the regular clock signal. It's very regular. It's 4.3.4 something megahertz. There's just nothing odd about it. And that is because we're running off a, I need to move this a little bit. We're running off a cartridge and I believe we're only accessing the ROM and probably non-contended RAM. So I'm going to run Manic Miner. There we go. So this is actually just the start screen and the clock signal still looks the same. And now we start the game and there we go. You see that flickering right there? I'm gonna zoom out a little bit more and I'm gonna do single captures. And look at that. You see the CPU being installed for a bunch of cycles. It's, there's not just one or two, that's a lot of them. Now that was a particularly good capture, let's see. There you go, another big one, another one. So there, they look mostly regular, yeah. So there, there was no interruption. So there, the CPU must have been accessing non-contended memory. And boom, there's another one. So anytime that happens, the CPU is just stalling and waiting for the ULA to do its thing and read some pixels to send to the video signal generating chip. Okay, here we have the Invest Spectrum Plus board and we're hooked up again to pin 6, which is the um, CPU clock um, signal generated by the ULA. And let's turn it on and we see the same thing. We see a very regular 
clock signal, which is great. And now I'm going to launch again Manic Miner. And we're fine in the main menu. And then the game starts. And this doesn't change at all. We can zoom out like before. We can do single captures and the clock is regular. So the Z80 CPU never stops working. That's why we're getting a 20% improvement in speed. Faster is better. So this should be a plus for the Invest, right? Eh, not exactly. For people hoping to play the same games as an Azetic Spectrum, finding that a game plays 20% faster is not always a good thing. Maybe for something slow like Night Lore or some kind of turn-based game like Lords of Midnight, that would be a good thing. But for a Fast and Furious arcade, it could make it unplayable. Most complex systems have unintended consequences, behaviors that weren't designed specifically, but end up being consistent and used by programmers. This happens with undocumented opcodes in the Z80, for example, and this is also the case of the floating bus in the original Sinclair ZX Spectrum. When a program reads from an unattached port, it will accidentally return the data present in the data bus at that very moment. That would mean the data that ULA is reading from video memory to create the display signal like we just saw except when it gets to the borders on the sides, during which time the ULA is idle and it returns FF. Guess what? Some games like Arkanoid decided to be clever and use that to synchronize the game with the raster beam. The program would pull a non-existent port until it returned a number other than FF, and then it would know it was at the beginning of a horizontal line. What did the Invest Spectrum do? They actually implemented it correctly, so when you read from an unattached port, you always get FF. As a result, games like Arkanoid or Short Circuit would get stuck in an infinite loop waiting for the horizontal retrace. Whoops. Actually, when the Spectrum Plus 2 was released, it also implemented the floating bus correctly, meaning always return an FF. So that became the correct way, and some of those games had re-releases that were patched not to rely on the floating bus behavior. So really, the Invest was kind of doing the right thing and was kind of ahead of its time. Unfortunately, that didn't help with lots of kids being disappointed that their favorite games would lock up them. The ULA in the Sinclair ZX Spectrum has one output pin that controls the sound. Depending what bits you write to the FE port, it goes to the mic port, bit 2, or the mic and the internal speaker, bit 3. The ULA does this because it can output analog signals, so if bit 3 is set, it will generate a slightly higher voltage which activates the transistor that sends the signal to the speaker. However, an unexpected behavior of that system that programmers discovered is that if you enable both bits 2 and 3, the sound generated is louder than just bit 3 alone. On the Inves, the ULA replacement chip is not an analog chip and it just outputs TTL level signals. If bits 2 or 3 are on, it will produce enough voltage and send the sound both to the mic port and the speaker. But, and I'm sure you know where this is headed, if bits 2 and 3 are set, it actually outputs nothing. After all, that wasn't part of the original spec, so it was just a side effect of the original hardware. So any games that try to play extra loud music with that trick, or cause volume variations with it, will get nothing on the Invis. Whoops. So here's a really famous game, Dizzy, and you get this very interesting sampled music on the original ZX Spectrum. And you get almost nothing on the invest. You just hear the bass line. That must be the only thing that we're playing at medium volume. And this didn't happen just in a few games. It happened in quite a few games. Another example is Manic Miner. In the main menu, you usually get that really loud music using this trick. And on the invest, you get nothing. Actually, worse than that, not only you get nothing, you get some really weird color flashing, which I'm not exactly sure why that's happening, but it must be some other hardware change side effect. So yeah, the Invis was not very compatible sometimes. There's another category of graphic glitches on the Invis spectrum that is well understood. Check out these handlebars at the top of the high score table in Paperboy. And now look at the same screen on the Invis. What's happening here? If you look closely, you'll realize that the handlebar is actually rendered on the border itself before the top of the actual screen starts. That's done by changing the colors of the border with very specific timings, and that's why it also looks a little chunky. 
In order to do that, the program needs to know when the vertical retrace of the beam starts and then count a number of very specific cycles. So why does that fail on the inverse? On the Sinclair ZX spectrum, the vertical sync interrupt is sent whenever the scan beam moves roughly to the very top of the screen. That leaves something like 4 milliseconds until the screen starts being drawn again. On the inverse, on the other hand, that interrupt isn't generated until the beam is pretty much at the top of the screen already. That's why the handlebar is being drawn all the way down and to the side. This same effect happens in other games. For example, in Super Wonder Boy, when you pause the screen, the developers decided to create this cool effect that the word pause scrolls along the top of the screen on the border. On the inverse, you can see the same thing, but much lower. Incidentally, that first video I showed you was from a Spectrum Plus 2. It turns out that on the original Sinclair ZX Spectrum, it looks like this. So the timings must have changed slightly between the different models, and this was clearly coded with a Plus 2 in mind. Given how much this interrupt must be used in games to synchronize the rendering, I'm actually really surprised there aren't lots of other games with really noticeable graphic glitches. But at least in my research, I was only able to find a handful. So a pretty obvious and visible difference of the Invest Spectrum Plus board is the lack of plus 12 and minus 5 voltages on the edge connector. And you can see that because the, um, the pins that would normally have 12 volts and minus 5 volts are not even connected. So it's there should be two of them in a row, like look, this one and this one are just not connected to anything. And they're not definitely not connected on the other side. The other side is the underside of the edge connector, which has different signals. So those two would be carrying 12 volts in a regular spectrum. And this one over here would be carrying the minus 5 voltage on a regular spectrum, and they're just not connected at all. And that makes sense because, as we've seen in a previous video, this board doesn't really generate a stable 12 volt or a minus 5 volt because it doesn't need it for its RAM. Is that a big deal? Not really. There aren't that many things that would use those voltages on the edge connector. I'm actually hard pressed to find any. I looked it up and maybe the interface one had an RS232 serial port and that needs 12 volts. So that would be something that doesn't work with this. I believe you can still read micro drives with the interface one with this board. And then other possibilities could be, and I don't even know that this is for sure, is um, maybe a memory expansion using the old 4116 RAM chips would need minus five and plus 12, but I'm not even sure there were any made of those. And chances are you want one with different RAM chips that don't need those voltages. So. I think that's not a big loss. And there you have it. We had a very in-depth look at the Invest Spectrum Plus and what made it different from the Sinclair ZX Spectrum Plus. So the question now remains, was the Invest Spectrum Plus a good machine? And it depends. In a way, it was because it improved on the original Sinclair ZX Spectrum in multiple ways by using better components, by fixing up some side effects. But unfortunately, it also introduced its share of problems in particular with compatibility issues with existing games. So I could see how it'd be really frustrating as a kid to save your money, go out, buy this machine, and not being able to play the games that you wanted to play. So I'm afraid that reputation for not being very compatible was rightfully earned. On the other hand, looking at it nowadays, it's a better machine over the original ZX Spectrum, and it could lead to some interesting new developments if people were focused on this particular hardware. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video, and if so, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. Until next video, see you then.